Me. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Just to give you a little bit of an idea about my uh, background. So uh, uh, I am uh, currently the Adult Services Director of Park Avenue Neuropsychology, um, which is no Global Neuropsychology Solutions in New York. I'm also the managing member of the Beatty Group. I have a PhD in clinical psychology from John Jay College and the Graduate Center CUNY. I have an MA in forensic psychology, a law degree from the Ohio State University. I practiced law for 10 years before going back and getting my PhD. And I went to uh, undergrad at Columbia. I interned at the California Department of State Hospitals, Metropolitan State Hospital, Los Angeles, and did my residency at the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services Special Commitment Center. So that's sort of my background. If you want to ask me about any or all of that at the end, I'm happy to tell you how I ended up where I am. Um, but I'm going to talk to you um, about, so notice that in the title, I make a, a distinction between forensic and legal psychology. So legal psychology, psychology and law is typically the more research focused and forensic psychology is typically um, the more clinically focused. So um, that's what that distinction is. Um, let me just uh, start off. I know you all will know this um, since you are uh, likely um, coming to the psychology uh, group because of an interest in psychology, but psychology is typically sort of defined as the study of behavior and mental processes, the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. So in science, right, we collect and evaluate information using systematic observations and measurements. So that's the science part. Um, we particularly study behavior. So I'm, I'm a human psychologist, but as you know, there are psychologists who spend their entire careers like studying um, you know, animals. Um, note that, um, uh, or I'll pause on that. And then we also study uh, mental processes, right? So, um, a behavior is anything that can be directly observed, so I can sit someplace and watch someone behaving, um, but mental processes are private internal experiences, thought, perceptions, feelings, and memories. Note that um, what that boils down to is I'm trying to observe and measure um, behavior, which is directly observable, um, but observing and describing um, studying mental processes is a little bit more difficult because I can't directly measure those, right? I have to think about ways that I can measure mental processes by making, by extrapolating from things that I can observe, such as behavior. Now, both law and psychology are disciplines that are fundamentally concerned with human behavior. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that by sort of talking about the, um, the values of the two disciplines, right? So the values of psychology, uh, psychology is descriptive, right? We try to describe what we're seeing, but we're trying to describe the behavior that's occurring. We try to explain why that is happening. Um, psychology emphasizes group characteristics. As psychologists, um, we are at our most scientifically pure when we are talking about group, um, uh, group uh, distributions, right? So you, you will know that behavior is normally distributed, or at least we assume it is in most instances. So that's really where the science of psychology is at its strongest is when we're looking at the way groups um, behave and, what, and look for things that we can say about groups. Um, psychology is also future oriented, right? Uh, particularly on the clinical side, um, the idea that change is possible in the future, um, better adaptive functioning is possible in the future, is sort of baked into the whole idea of psychology. With respect to the law, however, they look to be prescriptive with respect to human behavior, right? They, the, the law tells humans how they must behave and it regulates that um, with jails and police officers and judges and courts and things like that. Um, law emphasizes the individual, at least in the common law system. So uh, the United States is a common law jurisdiction, um, uh, Canada, the UK, and um, the majority of the, um, uh, of the um, former colonies of the United Kingdom are mostly um, common law jurisdictions. That's often um, juxtaposed um, by the continental system, which is used in France and many of its former colonies. 
Um, and then there are other approaches to legal systems um, throughout the rest of the world. Um, but in the United States, so in the common law systems, the emphasis is on individual responsibility, right? So if you're operating a motor vehicle and you're speeding, then we're going to hold you personally accountable for that, regardless of whether the vehicle is yours, right? So we're not going to try to hold, hold the person who gave you the car uh, responsible. It's also past oriented, right? One of the key features of legal punishment, particularly in criminal settings, um, or even in civil tort cases, right, where you're where you're you've done something wrong in the past that you have to compensate somebody for, um, it looks to the past to have its influence. And then also note that law is adversarial, at least again in the common law system. So those two things um, sometimes clash. Those those two value systems. Um, what psychology and law does, or forensic psychology, is try to bring the science. Um, to legal questions in order to uh, promote better outcomes. So I'm going to talk about three different areas where we do that. The first one I will just briefly cover, and that is mental illness in the justice system. I'm sure it will come as no surprise to you, or maybe it will, um, that the largest um, accredited mental hospitals in this country, the top three are all jails. Uh, so Cook County Jail, LA County Jail, and Rikers. Um, so we have, we have huge, huge numbers of people um, with mental illness who are involved in the criminal justice system. And you probably have heard about deinstitutionalization. So um, through the 1960s, the early 1960s, um, there were much more robust state hospital systems. So if someone was mentally ill and could not be cared for by a family or um, uh, someone else in the community, then they would go to a state hospital. Now, the state hospitals um, have a, a track record that is uh, not all good. And in fact, there were a number of state hospitals that were um, quite horrendous and treated people uh, very poorly. Um, and that sort of became wild, widely known in the mid 50s to early 60s. And that led to a process of deinstitutionalization. So that is to say, a, um, an emptying out of the state hospitals. Now, what this graph that you're looking at here is if you look at that top solid line, that is aggregate institutional rate. So that's both hospital and prison rates. Um, the long dashes, so the the second one down, if you start from the left, is mental hospitalization rate. So that's hospitalization at state hospitals. And then if you look at the prison incarceration rate, that's the very bottom line as you um, read from the left, start from the left. And what you can see is that as deinstitutionalization got started in the late 60s and then through the early 70s, and in fact, in 1976, you see that the rate of people being admitted to mental health facilities drops dramatically, but um, the overall rate of institutionalization remains largely the same because the prison population starts to grow almost one to one for the deinstitutionalization. So um, that is why our jails and prisons are um, uh, very large mental health care facilities in many ways, um, because um, instead of um, as a society, instead of uh, finding ways to treat those people in the community, they often are um, incarcerated. So let me just also say, um, so this is the prison admission rate broken down by race. Um, so you can see that uh, the very bottom reading from the left um, is the orange is, is white uh, prison admission rates. The black, is, uh, black people is green. And then the ratio of white to black is that blue dotted line. Um, I just want to point out to you, this is roughly the same time scale of the, of the figure that I just showed you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to superimpose those. So in case you have um, heard about um, the fact that African Americans and um, brown and black people in general are overrepresented in prison, um, that is absolutely true, and that also coincides uh, with the timing of the deinstitutionalization. I don't know that they're necessarily connected, but it's interesting to see that the um, disparity increases. 
One of the problems, so this is where my public policy role comes in. One of the problems with housing people um, with mental illness in correctional settings is um, that it is an incredibly expensive way to do it. Um, so it, this is a statistic from uh, the, uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is part of the Department of Justice. So the corrections price tag uh, uh, that is identified for uh, fiscal years uh, 1982 to 2001 is 60 um, billion dollars. Is that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? No, no, 60, yes. Um, which is a lot of money. Um, let's just think about how much that is. So we can think about what a, um, what a million dollars is, right? So um, a million dollars seems like a lot of money, but it's sort of like something that we can wrap our heads around. So I'm gonna try to put that in context for you. I'll tell you that 1 million seconds is 11.6 days. Okay, so that's, that's a million. We're talking about 60 billion here. Knowing what a million seconds is, how many days do you think a billion seconds is? So I'm trying to give you a conceptualization of how much larger a billion is than a million. Just in your own heads, come up with how many days you think a billion seconds is. All right, well, I've done the math. So a billion seconds is 31.7 years. So when I'm right, the, the, the order of magnitude <laughs> Um, as you can tell by the exponents, right, is uh, exponential when we start talking about um, millions versus billions. So $60 billion a year is like real money that we could actually be putting to, to different uses. And in fact, here's a graph that shows you um, the cost of incarceration per year. This happens to be in California. Um, this is for a drug offender. It costs $27,000 a year to put them in prison, and it costs $4,500 a year to treat them in the community. Um, that's a difference of 83%. So we are paying 83% more than we need to to incarcerate rather than treat. Uh, just in case you wonder, so those graphs that I showed you ended in about 2000. Just in case you wonder if it's gotten better since then, here's 2000 to 2014. The population of mentally ill inmates, this is in, again in California, it's almost doubled over that time. So this is not a problem to which we have found a solution. All right. so. That's the sort of clinical part of psychology and law. So there are psychologists who work, they're correctional psychologists. They work in prisons and in jails, and they provide treatment to individuals who are there. Um, there are masters prepared folks, so people with um, licensed mental health counselors, licensed independent clinical social workers, uh, licensed substance uh, use uh, and uh, substance use disorder counselors. All of those people are working in the jails. Um, and in fact, if you want to have a clinical role short of getting a doctorate, um, a lot of master's prepared folks find um, relatively high paying uh, jobs in uh, correctional settings. Now I'd like to talk to you about psychology and law. So this is the more research focused. And I know last year you had a presentation um, that focused on some of this. So this, this may be um, uh, cumulative for some of you. Um, this is um, a statistic, it's a little bit old at the moment, it's from 2012. The Innocence Project is a, is a nonprofit pro bono legal service that has helped people who have been wrongly convicted of crimes um, seek release. And they report that what the graph that you're looking at is the percentage of cases where DNA has exonerated someone after they have been convicted. So they've been wrongfully convicted, exonerated by DNA. And this graphic um, that you're looking at tells you what the cause of the wrongful conviction was. So um, you'll note that the starting at your left again, over 70% of the convictions that have been overturned as a result of DNA evidence um, resulted from eyewitness misidentification. So eyewitnesses, um, getting on the stand and saying, yes, I saw John Doe, um, I saw that man right there, uh, rob, the, rob the bodega. Um, forensic science problems uh, are also a major contributor. So that's things like bite marks and tool marks and uh, other things that don't have tons of empirical support. False confessions. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about false confessions, but that is its own whole sort of sub-discipline of psychology and law, and then uh, faulty informant testimony. So that's um, snitches um, testifying for reasons that were not based on the truth. Um, I'm going to focus on eyewitness uh, misidentification. Um, eyewitnesses um, are the single most, so many decades of research uh, into uh, jury decision making. Um, and juries find eyewitnesses to be the most persuasive form of evidence. Um, more persuasive than putting experts on the stand, more persuasive than the police officers. An eyewitness who is getting up and gets sworn in and says, yes, I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, that is a very um, sort of compelling thing for a jury decision maker uh, to be seeing. Um, and the scary thing about memory, right? So eyewitness memory, um, the scary thing about memory is that you can think that you are telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and you can be wrong. Um, there are a number of reasons that memory um, is um, not good. I'm not gonna talk about sort of the technical neuroanatomical reasons that it's not good. But I can tell you about what research has shown with respect to um, eyewitness testimony. Uh, the first uh, thing that I will mention to you is cross-racial identification. There is a cross-race effect in um, identification. This applies equally to everyone. Um, basically, you are better at identifying people of your own race than you are at identifying people of another race. Um, so this is true. Black people are better at identifying black people, Asian people at Asian people, white people at white people. Um, so there is a demonstrable impact when someone is trying to identify someone that they that is from a race that is not their own. There are also other effects um, that are known to influence. Um, there are other. Oh, oops, sorry. Oh, I got too excited. There we go. Got distracted by something popping up on my screen. Can you all see that? There we go. Okay. Um, stress and we weapons focus. Uh, so this is also um, the classic example here is at a bank robbery. So say that you're in the lobby of a bank when it gets robbed and the cops come up to you afterwards and ask you to identify the suspects or describe the suspects or they do a drive by um, and have a suspect and say, is this the guy? Um, one of the things people think um, when they are in highly stressful situations, um, they think that they are being very attentive to what is going on. Clearly, if I was in the middle of an armed robbery in a bank, I would be paying very close attention uh, to how to keep myself safe, right? That's sort of um, an evolutionary biology imperative. The problem with that is, is that due to that imperative, um, what we tend to focus on is the thing that is most dangerous. So if someone is wielding a gun and I'm trying to be attentive and keep myself safe, my focus tends to be on the gun, not on the person who is wielding it so much. So anytime you're under stress, the um, first of all, stress in and of itself can interrupt encoding. So I'm, I, again, I, I don't wanna to be too elementary. I know you all know this. So anytime you get sensory information in, right? So you gotta be able to receive it. Um, then you gotta be able to encode it. And then you gotta be able to store it and retrieve it for memory to work. So the encoding it is getting it in a, in a form where you can either consolidate it to long-term memory um, or let it go. Um, and anytime you're under stress, it messes with the way that your brain encodes information one of the examples of that is weapon focus, right? Is that if someone's waving a gun around in your face, you're gonna be paying attention to, and by extension encoding, um, the, the affective, um, um, affectively relevant portions of that interaction. Um, there's also unconscious transference um, that we know occurs. Um, that is just a face seen in one context being transferred to another context. And in fact, there, this is a real life example. There, there was a woman who identified a psychologist named uh, Donald Thompson 
as her assailant, she would she had been assaulted. Um, she gave convincing and detailed description to police after the fact of his face. Um, it turned out that she had seen him being interviewed on television at the time of her assault. Um, that provided an excellent alibi for Dr. Thompson, but also demonstrates how um, transference, contextualized transference can occur. Um, when we are encoding memories, right, um, that there, there is no such thing as like a pure memory that gets laid down on a, on a hard drive in our brains. That's not the way memory works, right? Memory um, is, is not a, the, um, the fidelity of memory as encoded and uh, stored is not infallible. That's a concrete example of an instance where things went awry. Um, suggestive and leading comments uh, can also um, really interfere with eyewitness identification. So the classic example of this is a police officer uh, coming up to a, uh, the victim of a crime and saying, hey, I have this picture here. We think this is the guy who did it. They'll hand the picture to the individual. The individual will compare their memory of the person to that photo. And if it's close enough, they'll say, yes, this looks like the guy. The problem is, is that after that, when you ask them about their assailant, are they remembering the picture, right? Because remember, memory is, re is constructive. So they've looked at this picture, tried to compare it to their memory, but then they've consolidated those two memories together, right? And stored them anew. So next time you ask for an identification, is, is there any way to tell um, to what extent the person is being influenced by the picture that they were shown by the police. Um, that's a real problem. So suggested leading comments. Uh, Pre-existing expectations. There are, as you know, um, the, the brain is very, very lazy. Uh, we use short, the brain will use shortcuts all the time um, to save itself cognitive uh, exertion. Um, and those can also influence what people believe they're seeing with respect to crimes. So beliefs about a sequence of actions in a case. So you can get temporal things wrong. You can have an honest witness who just reports things incorrectly because the events that they saw didn't follow the script in their head, right? And the heuristic, um, the fancy name for the script is the heuristic. The heuristic kicks in and that's what they sort of start to recite. Um, this uh, was demonstrated with a really neat piece of research. Um, the researchers asked um, people to watch a video and then they asked them a question um, and said um, about how fast did the car, and then they, the, the, they varied the um, descriptor that they used. So about how fast did the car contact or about how fast did the car hit or about how fast did the car bump or about how far did the car, uh, about how fast uh, did the car smash? Sorry, not far for any of those, fast for all of those. Um, and as you, as the descriptor got more extreme, right, the speed uh, that people estimated the car was traveling increased. So the average speed for someone, for a, for a stimulus that said um, about how fast was the car going when it contacted the other car, the average speed there was 31 miles an hour. Um, and if you used any of the others, hit, bumped, or smashed, uh, the average speed went up by 10 points. So all of those um, redound to um, explain why eyewitness memory um, is responsible for so many of the exoneration cases that the Innocence Project has um, been involved in. And I would just invite you to contemplate how, how many cases the Innocence Project has not been involved in nationwide, right? If, if we know that 70% of those wrongful convictions are the result of bad eyewitness testimony, and not because the people were lying, right? It's because our memory doesn't work the way that the law thinks it does, right? Our, me our memory is not a uh, high fidelity recording device. Um, it can be influenced by any number of extraneous factors. So one of the other things that on the research side that we do is to try to um, identify solutions for the criminal justice system to use. Um, how do you improve eyewitness testimony? There's a ton of things that you can do. 
um, that psychologists have been at the forefront of identifying. So blind lineups, for example, um, they're cheap, effective, they reduce unintentional communication, it avoids post-identification feedback effects. That's what I was talking about with the, with the person in the photo. If the person looks at the photo and says, yes, this looks like the guy, and the police officer says, yes, we got him, right? That is a post-identification feedback bias, right? Because you're, you're then, then the person is relying upon the officer who tells them that they got the right guy. So the picture becomes the guy in their mind. Um, not hard to understand the effect um, if familiar with uh, cognitive dissonance theory, right? Um, bias reducing uh, instructions. Um, so this is a this is a way of presenting um, mug shots to people um, in a way that reduces their bias. So one of the problems with a with a typical six pack. So that's the um, that's you see this on TV, right? The if you're trying to identify a suspect, you'll put people who look like them in a, a card, and you'll hand uh, six pictures to the person and say, "Hey, do you recognize any of these guys?" Um, one of the things that you can do is not do it that way and give bias reducing instructions when you are trying to do a photo identification. Um, this forces the witness to rely on their own memory rather than making comparisons. Um, the true criminal, so an example of how you do that is um, some of them are actually presented in computer programs. So the computer program will say um, the true criminal might not be in the lineup or the photo spread. And in fact, in some cases they're not and they use a lot more than a six pack. Uh, Unbiased lineup, um, actual suspect uh, should not stand out from the fillers. That's kind of obvious. Um, there's a thing called the mock witness test um, that can text this. Basically, the mock witness test is you pull somebody who doesn't know who your suspect is, um, and you ask them, um, which of these guys do you think did it? Right? They're, they're coming in completely cold. And if you get a certain percentage of mock witnesses who are picking your actual suspect, then you know that the um, fillers are not matching closely enough. Confidence ratings have been explored. Um, having witnesses indicate at the time of their initial identification how confident they are in the identification. Because as we've discussed, as time goes by, their memory is going to get more. Um, their memory is going to be infected essentially by everything that happens afterwards. So if the person estimates at the time of their initial identification, I'm 60% sure that could actually help give them wiggle room as they move forward. Um, if they then have questions about whether the person um, is actually the person they were trying to identify. Um, video recording, uh, sequential lineups, um, and then expert testimony about um, the of uh, memory. Uh, okay, so let me tell you about like one little piece of research that I did sort of um, in this same vein. So this is going to get a little technical and there's some, some legal technicalities to it. Um, I will run through it. If you have questions, I'm happy to explain it or talk with you about it after this lecture. So in the United States, um, most criminal statutes require two things to occur. So they require an actus reus, that's a bad act, and they require a mens re. And a mens re is a culpable mental state. So um, a typical statute um, might say, no person shall purposefully, that's the mens re, right? So you're doing it on purpose, cause the death of another. Cause the death of another is the bad act. Right. So if I say if the statute says no person shall purposefully cause the death of, death of another, you know, we're talking about murder. Right. So that's how the law would say you can't murder people. You got a bad act that they're prohibiting and you got a culpable mental state that has to go with that bad act. Right. Because if you if you are driving perfectly legally down the road and someone jumps in front of your car, have you committed murder? No. Have you caused the death, death of another? Yes. Right. So you got the bad act. But the reason that you're not culpable is because you didn't have a mens rea at the time, right? You're, you're doing everything exactly as you should and legally, um, and um, it's beyond your control. So given the same act, we're talking about homicide, uh, the person's level of culpability and the level of potential punishment is based on a judgment of the mens rea. Let me say a little bit more about that. So um, mens rea is a hierarchical construct higher levels subsume all lower levels. So the lowest mens rea is negligent. 
Um, if you do something negligently, it's without due care. Recklessly is the second lowest. Recklessly means um, it's a slightly higher burden, but you're act knowing that something might happen, you act anyway. Knowingly, uh, yeah, no, sorry, uh, that was probably confusing. So recklessly means that you're aware of certain circumstances and yet you go ahead and proceed. Knowingly means that you're pretty sure that um, something bad is gonna happen and then purposefully speaks for itself. You're doing it on purpose. Those aren't exactly the way those work, but just for present purposes, those are the four mens reis that you typically see in the United States. Note that mens re is characterized by the legal system as a moral judgment of blameworthiness, right? So from the law's perspective, a person perfectly innocently driving down the street, following all the laws, has a license, has title, has insurance, they're not speeding. If they hit somebody and kill them, then they are not morally to blame. So the law is not going to hold them um, to answer for that. From a behavioral science standpoint, right, just appreciate that what that's actually asking is for a retrospective social judgment about what the person was or was not thinking at the time they committed the illegal act. So let me show you why this is a problem. So just, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, we're talking about homicide, right? That's caused the death of another. We can have four different mens reis attached to that. Purposefully knowing recklessness and negligent, right? So no person shall purposefully cause the death of another. No person shall knowingly cause the death of another. No person shall recklessly cause the death of another. Now under the criminal code, we call purposefully and knowingly, we call that murder. Recklessly, we call manslaughter. And negligent, we call negligent homicide. And negligent homicide is a misdemeanor in many jurisdictions. So here's the difference in time that you can be sentenced to for each of those. So we'll start from the bottom up this time. So negligent homicide is punishable from 30, to, uh, 30 days to a year, right? So that's county jail, 30 days, um, and you're out. That's assuming that you were negligent in causing the death of another. Recklessly goes up to two to five, right? So that's man manslaughter. You can have further distinctions, right? Like involuntary manslaughter is a common law offense. Um, murder uh, is three to 10 years. Depending on the jurisdiction, it can be more. Um, and then first degree murder, uh, so this is second degree murder. Um, first degree murder is life or death, right? There, there are a number of states uh, in the United States where um, being convicted of, uh, um, of first degree murder in certain circumstances can lead to a, a death sentence, um, to say nothing of life in prison. All right, so everybody with me? Um, one of the problems with that is we know that people called upon to make decisions um, do not always do so rigorously. This is um, empirical research on the psychology side that is relevant to, um, to what we're talking about here. Um, some of the sort of foundational studies on how people make judgments about other people's behavior. Just appreciate that for a jury to make a decision, they have to consider the physical evidence, um, the testimonial evidence, and they have to decide whether that establishes the actus reus and the mens rea. Both of those have to occur at the same time beyond a reasonable doubt. So how good are juries at um, deciding what the mens rea was at the time of the offense? So this is a study that um, Mark Fondacaro at John Jay and I did together. Um, we wanted to know if we established a negligent mens rea could we get people to say that what was actually established was a purposeful mens rea? So we wanted to see how much of a spread we could create before someone would say, no, I, they, they didn't act purposefully. So um, what we did is we uh, used some other research um, that had these scenarios that we gave to participants to read. And then we asked them, hey, um, what is the mens rea here? So we knew um, there had been validated um, vignettes that had a specific mens rea. So we took the negligent vignette and we said to people, hey, um, did this person act purposefully? And we gave them the definitions of both negligent and purposeful. And 34.5% of respondents said yes. So we could get 34% of respondents to go from negligent to purpose. We tried negligent to knowing, 
we got 37% to go that far. So that actually does show that we're 3% better. So people were actually trying to make a distinction. From reckless to purpose, 75%. From knowing to purpose, 76%. Now, the largest yes um, in a single trial was from reckless to purpose. And on one of the vignettes, we got 90% of people to say that the person had acted purposefully in a situation where we know from a legal perspective, they had just acted recklessly. Now, keep in mind that the difference between reckless and purpose is two to five versus a death penalty. All right, so people making decisions with respect to mental states at the time of the offense, not that great. Um, people giving eyewitness testimony, not that great. People making eyewitness identifications, not that great. Um, so these are all systemic issues in the legal system. Um, and the cool thing about behavioral science, psychology, um, neuroscience, is that we actually can have a lot to say um, about um, how the legal system is set up to make decisions. Um, and um, the errors that may be sort of baked into that system. So that is what psychology and law scholars do, is psychology and law scholars do research like the study I just showed you um, to try to empirically demonstrate some of the errors that are baked into the legal system. Now I'm going to switch to forensic psychology. And forensic psychology is the clinical application of um, psychology within the, the judicial system. So basically this is um, the, the evaluations that I spend most of my time doing. So I I'm, I'm do do research, but I'm also mostly a clinical and forensic neuropsychologist. Um, the, the bread and butter um, exams uh, that we do are competency to stand trial, um, not guilty by reason of insanity, diminished capacity, mitigation, competency to be executed, sexually violent predator evaluations, uh, testamentary capacity, so that's your capacity to make a will, competence to waive Miranda, and then on the civil, so those are all sort of, um, with the exception of testamentary, um, all of the ones I mentioned so far are on the criminal side, and then on the civil side, so the non-criminal, um, emotional distress, disability um, evaluations, testamentary capacity. And then we also look at dissimulation or malingering. That's sort of one of the, the areas of expertise we have to develop as forensic folks. I wanna point out a couple of things to you. Um, first of all, you see that I have highlighted insanity in red on the screen and not guilty by reason of insanity. I do this to highlight the fact that as a psychologist coming to the legal system, um, I am constrained by the rules of the legal system. So the law gets to say um, that someone who is insane uh, is, is not held responsible in the some, same way as someone who's not insane. But as you all know, insanity is not a thing to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, or to, like I can't diagnose someone as insane, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to me as a behavioral scientist. Um, so it does have a legal meaning. So one of the things that we're always trying to do in clinical forensic psychology is to try to understand how we can answer a psycholegal question, um, right? Where, where the question is asking us, is this person insane? And as a psychologist, I'm like, I, like, I don't, like, like, that doesn't mean anything to me. But um, to answer that psycholegal question, what behavioral science can I bring to bear on the question to help the decision maker, or the judge, or the jury ultimately uh, decide? One other thing, I want to harken back to one of the very the, the second, third slide I showed you. Note that competency to stand trial um, deals with a present capacity, right? Are they today competent to stand trial? Um, note that that can be a behavioral assessment, right? I can actually go in and test whether the person you know, has good memory, has good language skills, is able to um, inhibit impulses, can help their attorney. I can go in and assess all of those things about their current capacity. As soon as I move in away from that, a note that I'm making retrospective judgments. So not guilty by reason of insanity means that at the time they committed the offense, they were insane. 
which means that I'm often asked to go back two, three, five years and try to figure out what their mental condition was at that time. So that is a less scientifically precise question for me to try to answer. Let me talk just about one of those examples. So competency, uh, eval, um, and I'm gonna sort of um, highlight a, 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 with a practical example, a lot of things that I, I've just said. So uh, you, uh, in the common law jurisdictions, you have to be competent to stand trial. So this originated in 17th century England, although um, the law of the um, Roman Empire, which is 30 BCE to 1453, recognized that an individual's ability to distinguish right from wrong was relevant to deciding the question of criminal culpability. Uh, common law from at least the 1300s has incorporated the same concept. Um, it's steadily evolved toward the consideration of mental deficit rather than moral deficit. Um, but anyway, the modern standard for competency to stand trial was announced by the US Supreme Court in a case called Dusky versus US. Um, and the Supreme Court in that case said that in order to determine whether someone is competent to stand trial, you have to decide whether they have a quote, sufficient present ability to consult with his attorney with a reasonable degree of rational understanding and whether he has a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings against him. So that is the legal standard. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I want you to figure out if this guy is competent to stand trial, that is what I'm trying to answer. So the, like I said, the law gets to set what the standard is. Um, you know, competency to stand trial is not in the DSM or the ICD. Um, you're not gonna find a diagnosis anywhere for that. So this is why we, we have a specialization, right? We, we answer psycho-legal questions. Um, very quickly, uh, note that there are sort of two key prongs here, right? It's a present ability. So that's the present that I was talking about. Consult with the attorney and a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings. Well, again, I can't observe those directly, right? In any meaningful way. So I have to think about what the underlying constructs that allow those things to happen are. So um, uh, here we go. Uh, yeah. So what I'm actually looking at when I do a competency eval is to look to see um, how, um, I, how uh, abilities that I can measure as a psychologist relate to those concepts that we just talked about. So can they understand their current legal situation? Can they understand the charges against them, the pleas available, the possible penalties? Do they understand the role of the judge, the defense attorney, and the prosecutor? Are they able to trust and communicate with their defense counsel? If someone is actively psychotic and has delusions that their attorney is part of the alien invasion who is trying to silence them, then that's gonna impact the question of their competency to stand trial. Um, are, is the individual able to help locate witnesses? Uh, can they aid in developing a strategy for cross-examination? Can they act appropriately during the trial? Can they make appropriate decisions? Um, note, um, by the way, that what we're being asked is whether they have the ability to do this, not whether they're willing to do it. So those are two distinct questions. Um, a finding uh, that a defendant is competent to stand trial does not mean that the defendant is mentally healthy and well-functioning. You can be floridly psychotic, and as long as you can form a rational and factual understanding of the proceedings and consult with counsel, you can still stand trial. Um, by the way, where did that list of functions come from? So I'm just gonna highlight real quickly, there's the standard that we talked about. And if you think about consult with the attorney, that's in purple, right? So that's, I've highlighted those functional issues that I just talked about in purple, because those sort of match up to that consult with the counsel prong. And I've also highlighted the rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings in orange, right? Because that's, those are sort of functional elements of the, um, of the, the rational and factual understanding prong. 